while plots and counterplots swirled around him, and enemies closed in from every side. Aegon II remained oblivious to it, all safe in the knowledge that his sister, Rhaenyra, was dead, and victory had been secured. But King Aegon II was not a well man, in fact, far from well. The burns he'd suffered at Rook's Rest had left scars that covered half his body. Mushroom says they had rendered the king impotent as well. Nor could he walk a single step without great effort and pain. His leap from Sunfire's back at Dragonstone had broken his right leg in two places and shattered the bone in his left, leaving it a mangled mess. The right had indeed healed well, Grandmaster Orwell records. Not so the left. The muscles of that leg were atrophied and weakened. The knee stiffened, the flesh melting away until a withered stick remained. It was so twisted that Orwell thought his grace might do better were they to cut it away entirely. Least then he could walk using the aid of a crutch. But the king would not hear of it. Thus, instead he was carried hither and yon by litter and could just about manage to stand with the aid of others. Only towards the end of his reign did he find the strength for walk with the aid of crutches, dragging his bad leg behind him. His movement was slow and an ungraceful shuffle. In constant pain during the last half year of his life, Aegon seemed to take pleasure in only in contemplating his forthcoming marriage to the young daughter of Boris Baratheon. Even the capers of his fools never made him laugh, we are told by Masham, though his grace did smile from time to time at my sallies and liked to keep me by his side to lighten his melancholy and help him dress, though no longer capable of pleasing a woman due to his burns, according to the dwarf. Aegon still felt carnal urges and would often watch from behind a curtain as one of his favourites, coupled with a serving girl or lady of the court. Most often, Tom Tangletongue performed the task for him, we are told. At other times, certain knights of the household took the place of dishonour and thrice mushroom was pressed into service. After these sessions, the fool says the king would weep for shame and summon Septon Eustace to grant him absolution. However, Eustace says nothing of this in his own account of Aegon's final days, and much like all of Mushroom's testimonies, it is up to the individual to choose what to believe, what is fact, and what is the dwarf's twisted version. Aegon had always been as sulky and brooding as a boy, and had always been quick to anger and slow to forgive. But the position he now found himself in and his loose grip on power served to make him even more irritable and difficult to converse with. Where he had been a glutton at the banquet table, he had all but lost his desire and appetite to eat. But one of his favourite hobbies did remain to him. Drinking. In his youth, Aegon could not be found without a glass of strong wine to hand, a trait that he carried to adulthood. His vintage of choice was a sweet arbor red something not so easily at hand during the final days of the Dance of the Dragons, as trade and movement of goods were severely hampered. Yet another factor to add to the king's irritability. Aegon would justify his excessive drinking as a method of managing the pain his burns and ruined legs caused him. That milk of the poppy would slow his wits and make him vulnerable, but those around him would argue that the sheer amount Aegon was drinking only served to slow his wits just like milk of the poppy. With Aegon's noted issues of fathering further children with his proposed new wife, it stands to question in retrospect why other ways of securing the succession were not sought in order to keep Prince Aegon the Younger off the Iron Throne. It was widely known that the promiscuous Aegon had fathered several bastards throughout his youth in King's Landing, with even Game and Pelhair being claimed among them. So why could Aegon not have legitimised one of them and named them heir? This suggestion would have surely have been mooted but any record of it has been lost. Regardless, there are several issues. Part of Aegon's whole claim to the throne, and justification of part of his claim, is that the children of Rhaenyra by Laenor were in fact fathered by Harwin Strong. Therefore, bastards. There would have been concern to name one of his own bastards as heir, as it could weaken Aegon's own claim. We know that it is likely that Aegon fathered bastards on the hordes of King's Landing or the serving girls of the Red Keep but it's highly unlikely any lord would support the naming of such a lowborn bastard as heir. If Aegon fathered any bastards on a highborn lady, it is unknown, but if he did, it stands to reason there would have been some record of it, some acknowledgement of it. Therefore, the naming of a bastard as heir was not a course of action Aegon or his small council really had, and the reality is the only hope to mend the round back together would be the marriage of Aegon the Younger and Aegon II's daughter, Jehera even if the king and his mother Alicent would refuse to see it. During this time, 
King Aegon II also commanded the burned ruins of the Dragon Pit to be restored and rebuilt to its former glory. He commissioned two huge statues of his brothers, Aemond One-Eye and Daron the Daring. He decreed that they should be larger than even the Titan of Bravos and covered in gold leaf. Other than this, we know little of where Aegon planned for these colossal memorials to his fallen brothers to be situated, but most likely it was to be in King's Landing. Aegon also held public burnings of all the decrees and proclamations issued by the Dayfly Kings, Christian Truefire and Game and Powerhair, once again establishing his authority over King's Landing. <laughs>